everybody once again, and today we're going to conclude Revelation chapter 21. We're going to pick up the narrative from verse 15, and unfortunately, as we've looked at our analysis of this chapter, I've normally tried to have nice breaks in our chapters as we go week by week, but unfortunately, in looking at Revelation 21, it's just not worked out like that. We've divided it over three weeks and we've just had a number of awkward breaks. So we're picking up the narrative at a pretty awkward point. But the good news is next week we will begin 22, which is the final chapter of mm -hmm. this wonderful odyssey, which odyssey which we've been going on. So let's just remind everyone of the structure. We're in the 10th scene of the book of Revelation and we've titled this scene, New Creation. So... Uh, this section is looking about the creation of the new heavens and the new earth as we as followers of Jesus uh, of Jesus Christ will be joined together with our God for all eternity in a new heavens and a new earth. And this chapter 21 is particularly talking about that renewal of creation. So we know back in the garden of Genesis in Genesis when Adam and Eve sinned that brought a factoring a fracturing to the relationship humanity has with God. And since that time, God had put in place the plan of salvation, which really was about Christ coming into the world and dying for our sins and rising from the dead. And one day, all of creation, as it was in that original garden state, will be renewed and it will be a place where God will dwell with humanity. So thus far in the narrative, we've uh, explored some of these features. And we recognized, importantly, that although new creation will culminate at one point when history comes to an end and Christ returns, uh, Christ will return and inaugurate the new heavens and the new earth. But we recognize that kind of in his first coming, he brought the kingdom with him. And although we have, we can look forward to this great vision, one thing that we've mentioned is that we are living in the age of the kingdom where now through the ministry of the church under the power of the Holy Spirit, God is bringing about this new creation, which will culminate eventually at Christ's return. So we've been recognizing how do we live really as followers of Jesus uh, in light of the unfolding new creation that God is doing through his church. And we recognize that the new creation is ultimately a place where what defines new creation is a recognition that God is creating a holy city or a new Jerusalem. This is a metaphor for the people of God. It's a metaphor for the church of Christ. And as we take the gospel message to people of all nations, that new creation is unfolding in people's lives and it will culminate, as I mentioned, at the return of Christ. So let's pick up the narrative from this awkward break in verse 15. We'll finish up the chapter this week. Uh, would somebody be able to read for us maybe from verse 15 uh, to the end of the chapter, please? I can do that. <clears throat> Thanks, Jill. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and high and wide and high as it is long. The angel measured the wall using human measurement and it was 144 cubits thick. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, and the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. Twelve gates were twelve pearls each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, 
and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor onto it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, but there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Thank you so much. So by now, just a quick revision for us. By now, we know that the book of Revelation employs a lot of beautiful metaphors and a lot of vivid images. This mm. is one of the, the staples of apocalyptic literature. And the big metaphor, a couple of key metaphors which are appearing here, as I mentioned before, is this holy city, this new Jerusalem, which is that picture of God's people. We also had a few weeks ago, looked at that bridal imagery that God's people are described as a bride beautifully adorned for Christ. And we have also mentioned the other piece of revision, which we'll quickly point out, is we've also mentioned every week virtually that the interpretation or the use of the Old Testament is quite frequent in the book of Revelation. And when we first begun this chapter, we spent a considerable time introducing new creation a few weeks back by talking about how these last two chapters utilize sections of the Old Testament. And I just want to remind this to you. It uses uh, a number of places in the Old Testament, most commonly, obviously, the early chapters of Genesis, which was talking about the original creation. How can you not? If you're going to talk about a new creation. You want to talk about it through a lens of the original creation, which, uh, as we read, read Genesis chapter one, we know this was described as being very good. We're getting back to that paradise, back to that very good state that God had originally created. We also know the uh, second part of the book of Isaiah, which is talking about a restoration of God's people, a redemption of God's people made possible by uh, a suffering servant who we know to be Jesus, and how through this redemption there would be new creation. We can see that language appearing on a number of occasions in these final few chapters. And of course, uh, the final few chapters from Ezekiel 40 to Ezekiel 48, which is talking about this idealized temple. And we know that in the New Testament, this idealized temple uh, is the church of Christ. It's a people of God who are walking in truth and spirit. So once again, I remind you of that because we will come across that as we go into the rest of this chapter. But let's just pick up in verse 15 and 16, verses 15 and 16. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city its wall, its gates, and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length, and as wide and high as it is long. Now, brothers and sisters, I just remind you, we recognized this last week that uh, this is another angel who's appeared on the scene. This angel uh, already featured, or this messenger already featured earlier on in the book when we looked at the seven bowls of wrath and we recognize that the seven bowls of wrath symbolize god's pouring out of wrath on those who have rejected the gospel message so this is one of those same messengers who had one of those bowls is reappearing and he in this visionary experience he has a measuring rod rod he has a measuring rod now a measuring rod we have a picture there of what an ancient measuring rod looked like a measuring rod was basically the equivalent of an ancient measuring tape it was an essential tool which ancient engineers used. We've already come across this image earlier in the book of Revelation, but it was a tool that ancient engineers and architects and builders used. And no surprisingly, the point of a measuring rod was to measure out sections as you built them. It was to get your dimensions right. And the purpose of measuring this city, this holy city, remember the language is figurative because you can't really measure people you can't measure people you can take a census of people but you can't measure people so we know that uh what is being described here is a figurative measurement of the people of god or this new creation and the point of measuring the point of uh god allowing his angel to use a measuring rod was basically to produce amazement it was to show the uh, glory that was to come in new creation. It's to show that in this splendor, 
in the grandeur of this new creation, uh, its dimensions are going to be so incredible and so spectacular that it gives hope to the people of God. But it also produces repentance. Why does God demonstrate his glory and his majesty at times? Well, it is to inspire and to amaze his people, but it's also to provoke repentance. And we saw, I have the reference there in Ezekiel chapter 33, we saw uh, in those sections of Ezekiel when that idealized temple was being presented, remember I said it was a temple which expanded. It starts off small like a mustard seed or it starts off small like a very shallow um, river system and it expands and expands and expands and expands until it becomes this great temple where God himself is dwelling in it. And this is the same with new creation. It starts off small and it grows and grows and grows and grows and grows. And grows. And the purpose of showing this measure, measuring rod is to show that the temple of God, the new creation, is growing and growing and growing and growing. It's expanding. And by doing this, it's hoping that the author, the, the audience who was, remember, those original seven churches can, number one, have confidence in their God and be inspired at the great future to come. But also for those churches who were going astray, it was to provoke repentance. So what we're trying to, to see here in these books, in these final few chapters of the book of Revelation is the great glory which is to come for those followers of Jesus who persevere and who continue to walk in faith and in truth, that one day we will be part of this glorious new creation. And for those who are not walking in the spirit and truth, uh, by presenting to them the glory of the new creation, it's an opportunity to provoke their heart to repentance. You know, the Bible says in the book of Ecclesiastes that God has put eternity on our hearts. And I think when we get a picture of the great future to come, this can provoke some people to repentance, to see that the current state of the world, the current state of the earth is not how God intended it, and it's not how things are going to end for us. Now, a lot of these pictures are taken from those chapters of Ezekiel, as I mentioned. Uh, and whereas those, in some cases, it borrows and it cites pretty much without any dispute from these chapters. But there's also times where John improves a little bit Ezekiel's measurements. And where we have the measurements that Ezekiel gave, John will repeat some of these, but he'll also improve on them in some way, uh, as if to say that the great picture that we get in Revelation is not only a fulfillment of Ezekiel, but it's even greater than what Ezekiel could have ever imagined. And I think this is wonderful. I think this is remarkable. In the Old Testament, God gives us a picture. And when Christ comes on the scene, that picture is fulfilled, but we realize how much even more incredible the fulfillment is of these prophecies. And I think that here the book of Revelation continues that point. It fulfills the Old Testament, it fulfills Ezekiel's vision. But in Christ, we realize that the picture is even more spectacular. And that's how God's revelation works. The more revelation we get, the more spectacular and the more grandiose we realize God is and the great hope that we have to come. So let's uh, explore a number of these important dimensions. But before I do, I want to make uh, something, I want to make something that's really, I want to stress something that's really important. Today, when we engineer buildings or we engineer homes or, you know, infrastructure, uh, it's the dimensions are usually practical in orientation. We build a road that is uh, a certain distance to take you from point A to point B. We build a house uh, on a patch of land uh, based on the size of the land and what can be fitted on that land. Or you might build a building with certain apartment blocks, depending on how much finances you have, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that was true in the ancient world as well. Buildings were built to conform to available land and uh, infrastructure-wise, what was the most important. But ancient buildings, one thing that was extremely important about ancient buildings were uh, the architectures, uh, the architects would take uh, certain liberties to ensure that the dimensions uh, also had or also conveyed spiritual or theological meanings. So as we've noted before, uh, we recognize that numbers had a dualistic point in the ancient world. And you would be well familiar with this because we know that in the uh, book of Revelation, it employs a lot of symbolic numbers 
to communicate theological points, right? And we've uh, explored this uh, on numerous occasions. Uh, but often the dimensions of buildings would communicate idealized spiritual meanings. So, for instance, uh, if we look at the, the pyramids, for instance, the uh, layout of the pyramids or the dimensions of the pyramids uh, communicated uh, important spiritual points to the ancient Egyptians. Now, sometimes people will try to connect too many lines and draw too many dots. But the main point is that uh, here in the book of Revelations, uh, here in the book of Revelation, sorry, um, when we when the book of Revelation records the dimensions of the new creation, we shouldn't hyper interpret these numbers, but we should recognize that there is also a theological meaning being expressed here. And when we look at the measurement, which is given in particular in verse 16, that they were, that the new creation was 12,000 stadia in length, in height, and also in breadth or width, what we recognize is that this is an idealized number. So rather than literally or hyperliterally interpreting this number, so if we were to do that, uh, one stadia, so the idea of a stadia came from the ancient running track. Uh, one stadia was 185 meters in length. So you would say, if you were trying to hyper-literalize this, you would say 12,000 stadia would equate to around uh, 2,220 kilometers squared. Uh, rather, that should be cubed, actually, because it's in all three mm -hmm. directions. So we, we recognize that it's not hyper-literal, literal, but nothing in the ancient world compared to this uh, cubic measurement um, so the point of saying this is to say that the temple of God, the new creation is going to be beyond all modern or more ancient or beyond any sort of comparison. There's nothing in this world which compares to the grandeur of new creation. Now, of course, there are some idealized number there. We know 12 tends to be the number associated with God's people. You had 12 tribes of Israel. You have uh, 12 apostles. That number 12 is a round figure to refer to the community of God's people. And we also know that thousand number is symbolic of a great length of time. Uh, so what we have here is this notion that new creation will uh, be the totality of God's people uh, living and residing with God for eternity. And that's uh, the point that's being described here. Just to highlight that new creation, it will be unimaginable. Uh, when God restores this new creation in this world, there will be no uh, human description worthy of doing this justice. And we recognize that this draws our attention to that verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, which says, uh, no eye has seen, no ear has heard what God has for those who love him. And just finally, if we're thinking about this cubic measurement, uh, this new creation is drawing our mind back to the holy of holies, in the Bible, we know that when the people of God built their temple, there was a holy of holies, the most, uh, the holiest part on the planet where the spirit literally dwelt. So the point being stressed here is that um, God's new creation will be uh, eternal. We will be in perfect unity with God, and it will be a place where God's presence is just like God was present in the Holy of Holies in the ancient, uh, in the Old Testament times, just like God is present with us, that we, our hearts, are now the place where God takes up residence. Um, and that point is well substantiated in the Old, in, in the New Testament. So, uh, brothers and sisters, any uh, questions or, or comments there? I think that should uh, make um, a, a lot of sense there. So let's move on now, brothers and sisters, to verse 17. The angel measured the war using human measurements. And it was 144 cubits thick. Now, it's very important here that the angel uses human measurements. This reminds us that 
often people think, oh, heaven is just a place where we float off and we go away and God is going to destroy this world and that's that's about it. But uh, anybody who studied the Bible and Revelation, as we know, is that that's not the plan. God's plan is not to just destroy creation. It's an idea of renewing. It's creating a new heavens and a new earth. Remember, the earth is not a bad place. The earth, since it's been subject to the, the fall, is a, a world in which God is restoring god is healing he's bringing it back to his original intention which is the point of the new heavens and the new earth so this is a place not where we float off into the clouds and we go away as most people think happens after we die no uh, the new creation is a literal place it's a place where god and humans will dwell together and it's why we will have resurrected bodies so this is why uh, there's a human measurement to it and it's also this idea that this establishment of this new heavens and the new earth although god will culminate it, as i mentioned he is bringing it about he's bringing it about through his creation through his people so a cubit was a standard uh it was it was a measuring standard uh back in the ancient world it's kind of akin to what we speak of when we mean a foot foot is um, a standard measuring unit which is around in our day but it was equivalent to measuring from the tip of your elbow to the top of your middle middle finger so that would be the standard of that was what was meant by a cubit it was like a measuring device which was from the your elbow to the tip of your middle finger and it was standardized to about 18 inches or just over uh, uh 45 centimeters or just under 46 centimeters rather so again 144 cubits we recognize is uh, an idealized number obviously 12 times 12 uh is this idea that uh you have god's people remember god's people were the number 12 symbolized god's people just like today if i say that meal was a 10 or that movie was 10 out of 10 i mean to say that it's a perfect meal or it's a perfect movie so that number 12 was idealized to refer to god's people so uh, we recognized earlier in the book of revelation when we came across the uh, 144,000 who were the faithful remnant of god's people who give rise to the mixed multitude it's all idealized now if we were to put this in literal sense remember it's not meant to be interpreted hyper literal but if you are a mathematician and you want to try understanding what 144 cubits would uh, result in it would be uh, 66 meters thick now recall last week i mentioned that when we spoke about walls i mentioned that walls were vital infrastructure things like walls and city gates were vital infrastructures in the ancient world just like today we talk about governments being responsible for building roads and schools and dams and all sorts of things well governments in these day in the ancient world were responsible kings were responsible to build walls and to build city gates and all those things why because it was a form of security right if you had an open city that city was was at risk of being attacked whereas if you have walls and gates the city can be defended and also if you have gates you can control who comes in and out you can control trade as it comes in and out you can control your citizens as they come in, in, in and out so walls i mentioned last week were extremely important now what we have here is we have a wall which is 66 meters thick now again this is this would be an idealized number uh if we compare this there wouldn't have been any wall in the ancient world which had this level of thickness right 66 meters if you had a wall that thick that's virtually impenetrable right? and that's the mm -hmm. point that's being uh stressed here if we look at uh say in the ancient writings of the historian herodotus he made the point that babylon ancient babylon had extremely thick walls which they could ride chariots on that's how thick the walls are but here in these idealized numbers here in 21 the walls are even thicker than anybody would have understood or anybody could have possibly imagined so the point i stress is not to give a literal dimension but just to say that the sheer magnitude of god's creation is something that we can't fathom and it's going to be something which is secure it's something which is perfect. The great innumerable mixed multitude from Revelation 7, 9 is going to be living in perfect unity with God. It's going to be uh, a perfect new creation where we will never be at risk of any bad thing, any evil, any invasion. 
God's creation will be perfect. It will be all in all. And as we mentioned, because this is a metaphor for God's people, this description is a lavish metaphor for God's, pe God's people. It's really a, a splendid uh, and glorious image of that great mixed multitude, that this great mixed multitude is being pictured like this splendid city that nobody can even uh, imagine. Uh, we are secured in God's presence. We are perfect and holy in the new creation, in God's presence. Uh, let's uh, pause there for any uh, questions or any markers people want to drop here. Let's get down to now verse 18 to uh, 20. So we have a list of uh, precious stones which are um, listed here. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first was, the first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third uh, agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh crystallite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh uh, jacinth, and the 12 uh, amethyst. So again, we notice that number 12 is being pictured there or that, that idealized number 12 is being presented there. But this again now is another presentation that new creation is going to be glorious and indescribable as it's in its beauty. So as we can imagine, uh, precious stones as they are today are, uh, beautiful to look at and they're valuable to look at and the point here is that new creation will be valuable new creation will be beautiful it will be beyond anything we can imagine now the echo here is to isaiah 53 in isaiah 53 verse 11 to 13 we read afflicted city lashed by storms and not comforted i will rebuild you with stones of turquoise your foundations with lapis lazuli I will make your battlements of rubies, your gates of sparkling jewels, and all your walls of precious stones. All your children will be taught by the Lord, and great will be their peace. Uh, so again, as I mentioned before, these sections, these latter sections of Isaiah are cited heavily. Here's another reference to them. Remember, in Isaiah, his main point is redemption and restoration uh, leading to new creation. And what has happened in Isaiah? Isaiah, the people have been judged for their sin. They've been afflicted. They've been destroyed. And now God is rebuilding them. He's promising to rebuild them. And the image or the metaphor he's using to describe this rebuilding is glorious stones and glorious, glorious beauty. And that is being pictured here that though we might be afflicted, there is a new creation which is glorious in its beauty. Its beauty can be compared to precious stones. And there were a lot of attempts in the ancient world for craftsmen and for cities and temples to design their uh, cities and to design their temples using precious stones or alluring presentations. So if we look at some of the features of ancient Babylon, they tried to build these great uh, walls and these great gates, which were uh, alluring and to show and to highlight the magnitude and the wealth of the city. You know, ancient temples would be built uh, with precious stones, and they would be paved in a way which made them look spectacular. If you've ever, um, well, if you were to go to the Parthenon in ancient Greece, in Greece today in Athens, we would know that the Parthenon is just the uh, the shell, uh, because obviously the interior has been destroyed. Uh, but before there was all these these beautiful mosaics and these golden statues and. The, what we were, are known as the Elgin marbles. So it was common to build cities and temples to try to build them with alluring presentations and precious stones. Uh, so the point here is to say that God is building this precious, this new city, uh, this new creation. It will be the most uh, indescribable and the most beautiful thing. And some of the language here is probably drawing on Ezekiel 28, verse 13. And if we, uh, if you remember the context of Ezekiel 28, which has come up before, 
Uh, the king of Tyre is being criticized. The king of Tyre is being compared to this great and lavished king who thought he was so good, who thought he was so wealthy, you know, and he's being cast in the light of even heavenly language. He's being spoken about as a king who, you know, oh, you thought you were in the Garden of Eden. You thought your community, your society, your empire was beautiful and massive it was as beautiful as the garden of eden you thought and there's an indictment by the prophet ezekiel here against the city so this same language is being employed here that god is one day going to build he is building his people into this great and beautiful um precious new creation in his sight now what's important now to recognize is that and this is a point I'm going to repeat later on, but I want to put it down here is to remind everybody uh, that by now, you know, because I've said it so often, but I keep repeating it because it's so important that the temple is not a building, but it's a people group. So what is being described here, this precious, these beautiful, precious gemstones is not saying that one day God is going to build this great temple and it's going to be so marvelous, but he's building a people group who are spectacular. He's building a people group in his sight who are indescribable. And the most important point that these stones represent is if you're keeping score at home, uh, you would know, a biblically literate audience would know that the 12 stones uh, here represent the 12 stones which were on the high priest's breastplate. So we know the high priest wore a breastplate. And on, and on this breastplate, there were 12 precious stones. And under these stones, there was a name of one of the tribes of God's people. And the point that's being stressed here is that God's people are a picture of these 12 precious stones. The point of the stones, the gems on the high priest breastplate is to say that these are the people of God. This is God's holy and righteous people. And that's what's being presented here is that those who feature, those who are prominent in the new creation are these precious, beautiful and glorious stones in God's sight. Now, I just want to say one more thing about these uh, 12 stones, which is really important, is that the precise identification of some of these gemstones is unknown. So if you were to read a commentary on the book of Revelation, or if you were to uh, read even in your Bibles, you might see a footnote here, which says that the precise identification of these gemstones is unclear or unsure. Now, translators, in some cases, we know what these gemstones are, or there's a modern equivalent. Uh, but in other cases, translators have done their best to characterize what these stones look like instead of giving their actual name uh, to try to characterize them for the benefit of the audience. But just to quickly try our best to identify if you are pedantic as to what these stones are, well, Jasper was basically, uh, is basically the ancient uh, diamond. It's the equivalent of the diamond. Um, sapphire, which is... Um, comes in a number of different colors, but bluish is that main color, or was sometimes called lapis lazuli. And uh, the key thing about lapis lazuli is sometimes uh, in the apocalyptic or the poetic language of the book of Revelation or even the Old Testament, God's throne was depicted on top of the clear glass uh, made of lapis lazuli. So that sapphire color uh, is also associated with God, and here the connotation is God's people. Uh, and we can see in, if you were to read uh, Exodus 24, actually, could somebody bring up um, that reference to uh, is Exodus 24, verse 10, and read that? In the context, uh, God's people have gathered at Mount Sinai. They've been given the Ten Commandments, and they've been given the law, and now uh, they have this incredible picture of God here. Moses, Aaron... Nadid and Abdu are the 17th elders of Israel went up and saw the God of Israel under his feet. There was something like a path made of lapis as bright blue as the sky, but God did not raise his hand against these leaders of the Israelites. They yeah, saw that's perfect, God. Sue. That's perfect. Right? Yep. Sorry. Yep. Sorry, but can you see that in, in what they see in the vision there? They see uh, Moses sees... Uh, God and he sees under his feet, well, he sees basically the throne room and he sees mm -hmm. under his feet the pavement of lapis lazuli. So sapphire 
have that connotation. But um, then we have uh, Chalcedone, or the English translators use the word uh, agate. But Chalcedone uh, was, I mean, Chalcedon was a place in uh, that ancient Near East or a region which was familiar to the seven churches. Uh, it's in what we call modern day Turkey, but it was a it was a um, a gemstone mined in Chalcedone. Uh, so in those mines there. Uh, emerald is uh, akin to what we call emerald, those beautiful uh, green gemstones. Um, uh, sardonyx. Sardonyx uh, is a sort of uh, translucent sort of red. It comes in different colors. It's like an orangey brownish red. It has some streaks as well. Uh, and that's why uh, the authors there uh, equate it um, with onyx. But it's it's kind of a brownish orangey sort of color. Then you've got... Uh, 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 sardion, which is a kind of reddish color, which is why they call it ruby. It's that kind of reddish, dark red color. Uh, you got crystallite, which is like a topaz golden color. Uh, beryl is like a bluey greeny sort of color. And topaz is not what we equate with topaz, but this is more of a crystallite sort of, uh, uh, it's like a gemstone, which comes in sort of various uh, greenish colors. Um, uh, chrysophrase, which is the uh, Greek word, which there are the derivative chrysophrase, uh, is like an an aqua a Turkish sort of uh, gemstone. You got jacinth, which is a sort of uh, zirconian sort of uh, stone. It's sort of a, it's like an array of colors you can get uh, um, in that. And then of course you have uh, the final one, which is mentioned there, which is uh, amethyst. Uh, and that, of course, is um, it's kind of like a violet or like a purple um, stone. Mm. So that's if you want to sort of understand what those stones are. But as I said, the identification is, is in some ways unknown. In some cases, the translators um, will sort of characterize a stone to help us there. But most importantly, they represented the 12 stones on the high priest breastplate. And it's a picture of God's people that we are this beautiful gemstone uh, in God's in God's sight. Um, uh, any, any questions there? Any comments, brothers and sisters? Yeah. Oh, oh, oh wow, course. that looks great. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a, as a marker of application. I think it's always important to recognize that you and I are like precious gemstones in God's sight. That He's polishing us. He's He's polishing us for uh, that new creation. And we remember in Zechariah 9, 6, it says, the Lord their God will save his people. On that day, as a shepherd saves his flock, they will sparkle in his hand like jewels in a crown. Um, that's that's uh, a, a beautiful picture of God's people that were like jewels in God's hands. Isaiah 62, verse 3, you will be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, a royal diadem in the palm uh, of your God. So it's imp it's this important picture, but brothers and sisters, I always want to remind you that uh, how a precious gemstone, how are they formed? A geologist will give a, a much better uh, analysis of this, but we know that gemstones are, they're, they're mined, but they, they begin as rock or as molten rock, which is exposed to harsh, harsh temperatures and conditions before eventually it cools <clears throat> and becomes a precious stone, which can be polished. And we just want to remind us that that image of us being like jewels or gemstones in God's uh, hand, like a diamond or an emerald or a sapphire or a ruby, uh, is important. But it's important to remember that we're not just sitting there looking pretty in God's hand. We are exposed to harsh temperatures in this world. We're exposed, exposed to the elements of this world, to the suffering of this world. And God, through that, he polishes us and he turns us into a gemstone. We should always remember that we're not just this beautiful crystal mm. sitting in a cupboard somewhere. We're being exposed uh, in this world that we can be molded into these beautiful gemstones in God's new creation. And I always think that that's a helpful illustration. And I wanted mm. to share that with you. Mm. Well, let's, uh, brothers and sisters, go on now to verse uh, 21. Uh, so 21 is, is probably a verse which uh, communicates uh, a common portrayal of heaven. Often people portray heaven as the the pearly gates or the pearly white gates where, um, you know, St. Peter or one of the apostles is standing out there to ready to take people's admittance. And, uh, and this is basically where that image of the pearly gates comes from, if you're wondering. But it says in verse 21, uh, the 12 gates were 12 pearls, each gate made of a single 
pearl, the great street of the city was of gold as pure as transparent glass. So those two images, the streets of gold and the pearly gates is where we get, this is where we get it from. This is a section of Revelation, if you're wondering. Uh, now, as I mentioned last week, uh, there's multiple gates uh, because um, the truth is, is that uh, in any city, there would be multiple gates. There usually wasn't just one entry point into the city. There was uh, multiple gates into the city. Uh, and there's 12. Again, that 12 is a picture of God's people. That number is reappearing and resurfacing uh, once again. And uh, also importantly, so if you remember uh, last week, we read that there was 12 gates um, and there were 12 messengers or 12 angels at the gates and ensuring that there was security uh, and conveying that, mm. security, that security. And remember we mentioned as well, if you look in verse 12, it says on the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, so again, it's that, that recognition that God has built this new creation uh, on the 12 tribes of Israel, first in the Old Testament, well, God's people have begun there. And then in the 12 apostles, uh, that the new creation has been built. So this is a new creation which takes both the Old and New Testament and brings them together. There's one people of God. There's not against what dispensationalists say. There's not two people of God. There's not an Old Testament, Old Covenant, and a New Covenant people of God. No, there's one uh, people of God, and this is uh, presented for us nicely here now the portrayals that we're seeing here of you know beautiful gemstones the pearly gates um the streets made of gold uh revelation doesn't invent this as we see there's already been some references in the old testament but you know revelation doesn't just invent this here um there were just like today you know today how people have uh, descriptions or there's like a sort of societal imagination that we have when it comes to heaven if it's ever if there's ever heavenly scenes portrayed on tv or if people ever talk about heaven they talk about you know light and white and angels and harps and clouds well there were some uh common descriptions or some uh common portrayals of heaven in rabbinic literature of the period and this idea of pearly gates uh, and imagining and co or conceptualizing heaven in this way was quite common. So what we see is that the book of Revelation is sort of taking these common themes and they're uh, showing that new creation is even more majestic than how society imagines it. And there's um, a particular book, so I meant, we mentioned before that uh, between the Old and New Testament, obviously a number of centuries elapsed. And during that time period, there's a lot of additional biblical texts, additional biblical literature uh, which when we read them they help us understand uh, the expectations people had in the first century and there was a book called Tobit which went back to a uh, which went back to its essential character or central character is a man by the name of Tobias but in Tobit chapter 13 there is a reference to um, city as like heaven being a place with paved with gold and precious stones and towers and walls of gold. So what I'm just trying to say, brothers and sisters, is that Revelation is drawing on some of the ideas that people had in this day, uh, talking about how God was going to bring about a new creation. But obviously the main uh, language and the main image is borrowed from sections of the Old Testament and sections of Isaiah. And we've already read that reference from Isaiah 54 because uh, it appears here once again. But one thing that I, I want you to note, brothers and sisters, is that remember this is contrasting. I've mentioned on a number of occasions that the book, the, old te the book of Revelation, uh, contrasts. There are antithetical images that are presented here uh, throughout the book of Revelation, and we have one of those here in New Creation. That remember I mentioned before that New Creation is the antithesis of death. It's the the antithesis of the lake of fire. Um, and remember that the, the new Jerusalem or the new holy city, the holy city is the antithesis of what that harlot city, the old Jerusalem, that, that wicked Babylon, which was judged uh, earlier in Revelation 17 uh, and 18 and 19. So remember that that harlot woman in Revelation 17, she was described as being dressed in purple and scarlet. And look, she was mm. adored with gold and precious stones and pearls. Uh, remember that like that is how she was presented that's how god built her but what happened she turned her beauty and became a prostitute a harlot 
So what we're seeing now is this contrasting. Uh, God had built his people, but they had rejected the beauty and their majesty, and they had turned their beauty toward uh, idol worship and toward uh, idolatry, I, uh, adultery, covenant unfaithfulness. But now this new creation eternally will be precious and holy. So there's that great contrast. Uh, and that image of the streets paved with gold or the great street, um, typically people have that imagination, the idea of the streets paved with gold in Revelation. Well, it's important to recognize that, uh, again, it's a metaphor and it's a, a singular street. The singular street is paved with gold. Well, cities and large cities, obviously, like today, no different. They had streets. They had streets and alleyways and things like that, which went through to the homes and the businesses and all those, those sorts of things. And there were streets leading in and out of the city. Uh, there were sometimes main streets or big, big streets where and the temple would be or the palace or whatever would be or main big streets where the trade would come in through or the tourists would come. Uh, and Jerusalem was no different. Jerusalem had a number of quite impressive streets. Jerusalem was an impressive city in the ancient world. It was a wealthy city in the ancient world. So it had a number of impressive streets. And some of these streets were quite wide. Uh, some of them were uh, 40 feet wide. So they were they were quite wide, and you know, I mean, we can afford to widen some of our major roads. That traffic can flow a lot easier. Um, but there were main streets, so uh, this language would have been familiar to the audience. They would have imagined Jerusalem in its day, uh, becoming part of this great new creation, uh, with with the main street paved of gold. Uh, and we talk about this gold; it's pure and it's transparent as glass. It's, it's like transparent glass well we know that gold uh, obviously is reflective when it's polished it's nice and uh, reflective and it shines gold shines when the sunlight hits gold it glistens right so it's this grandiose language um, but ancient people would sometimes encase mirrors with metal if you had uh, a mirror you would encase it with metal so that it gave off this glorious reflection in fact one of the ancient wonders uh, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world was the lighthouse of alexandria um, it had fire, it had candle light burning, but it would have these big bronze mirrors which would reflect, and that's how the light could go across into the ocean so that ships could see. Uh, so what seems to be being what seems to uh, be presented here is this idea that you know the gold will sparkle and it will reflect. And just like God's throne has that transparent glass and that transparent lapis lazuli, the stones and the pavements are sparkle and they are so majestic. Uh, they're so brilliantly cut, if I can use that expression, that they uh, that they reflect. And it's this idea that God's people, remember, we're those gems. We reflect the glory of God. So this the what makes us special as Christians is not just that we stay in a bubble, but that we emanate God's glory to the world as Christ works and moves in us, as the Spirit uh, transforms us and makes us more like Christ. The glory of God is... Uh, transparent it reflects to the rest of the world brothers and sisters if you and i are not reflecting to the world we've got to understand are we uh, really living for uh, god what makes a gemstone attractive what makes a gemstone beautiful it's sparkles sure. it's noticeable right as soon as you see um a ring on someone's finger or like an engagement ring or a wedding ring on a woman's finger that's what you notice and that's the same thing that as gemstones, we are to be noticeable in the world, that the world is supposed to look at us and see God reflecting through us uh, at this point. So, brothers and sisters, any uh, observations you would like to make? Are there any questions? Uh, so verse 22 now, I did not see uh, a temple uh, because, uh, I did not see a temple in the city because uh, the Lord Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. So, uh, brothers and sisters, this is um, an important for us to uh, note that the Greek word here for temple is nahos. Nahos. Uh, there were multiple, as I, I mentioned before, that there's there were multiple different words you could use to describe the temple. You could use the word um, hieron, the Greek word hieron, which referred to the temple compound, the temple itself, which included the temple and the outer courts itself. Uh, or you could refer to the Nahos, which was a specific reference to the Holy of Holies. So it's distinguishing the Nahos is distinguished 
from the other rooms or the other chambers in the temple or the outer courtyards. The Nahos was what? The Nahos was the very holy of holies where God dwelt. Um, and remember, the new creation, which is being described here, that cubic dimension, those 12,000 stadia in length, in height, and in breadth, is the Nahos. It's the very holy of holies because uh, now God's presence fills the whole world. Uh, so what, what's being stressed here is the Greek word is Nahos, holy of holies. Uh, so the point is, notice here that there's an absence in the new creation of the Nahos. There's an absence of the Holy of Holies. Now, this would have been shocking to the Jewish audience here. This would have been shocking to the earliest Christians. How could you have a temple where there's no Holy of Holies? It doesn't make sense. Uh, and in, again, in a sense, to the ancient audience, this would have been shocking, both Jew and Gentile, that uh, temples were important religious buildings. They were important shrines. They were important civic buildings in the ancient world. You couldn't just have a city without a temple. Uh, so this is shocking that we read that there's no holy of holies. But now, but then we remember that the reason why there's there's uh, no holy of holies is because God's presence now fills the whole of creation, whereas in the Old Testament the holy of holies. God's spirit dwelt and confined itself to that part of the, the world in that, that section. Whereas now, because of the spirit now dwelling within us, the Holy of Holies is now anywhere where God's spirit dwells and God's spirit now dwells mm -hmm. everywhere. So this is uh, an important point for us to make here because I've, mentioned before and the fact that i keep bringing it up probably demonstrates to you brothers and sisters that i don't really have much patience for those who misrepresent the book of revelation or who try to interpret it through the light of modern political events uh, this is a uh, evidence against a position that's taken by a lot of dispensationalists so it's taken by a lot of people who believe that uh, a third temple must be built in the modern state of jerusalem or i'm sorry in the modern state of israel in the city of Jerusalem. Uh, this is contra those who think that sections of Ezekiel or sections of here in Revelation are talking about a future literal temple, a future futuristic literal temple or city. Uh, but the, this is a position against them because what is this saying? That the Holy of Holies, the presence of God, is not confined to a building, but it's now in Christ going throughout the whole world as God's people go out throughout the whole world. So we should recognize that rather than there being a hope for a new physical temple, we should recognize that the new physical temple is a people group. That's what Jesus yeah. said to the Samaritan woman yeah. in John chapter 4 when she said, you know, tell me what is the right mountain to worship on? And Jesus says there is a time where true followers will worship in spirit and truth, not on this mountain or that mountain. So it's an important verse to cite to dispensationalists who think there's going to be a future temple in Israel or uh, those who believe uh, that this is a literal temple to recognize that it's a literal temple built on by people. It's built. We are the stones being made. If Christ is a, a real person, if Christ was a real person who was described as a cornerstone, well, obviously we are real people that are being made into this. Um, and, what makes this temple, this new creation, holy is what? The Lord is there. Mm. The Lord is the temple. That's why there is no holy of holies, because the Lord himself is the holy of holies. He is yes. the holy one. Yes. Uh, without the mm. Lord's presence there, it's just an empty room. Mm. Uh, and there's plenty of verses in the Bible I can use to cite it. What did Jesus say in John chapter 2? Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Uh, 1 mm -hmm. Corinthians chapter 3, 16, the other important 3, 16 verse. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's temple, God's spirit dwells in your midst? In other words, we are the temple. Uh, Ezekiel foresaw this when he says in chapter 37, my dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God and they will be my people. That's why uh, in this vision of new creation, there is no holy of holies because God is there. Uh, in the original creation, there was no holy of holies. God just dwelt there. Uh, so this is a wonderful hope that we uh, have to uh, look forward to here. Uh, any any observations you would want to make there? 
Well, friends, let's move on now to, to verse uh, 23. The city did not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of the, the God gives it light and the land. Mm -hmm. Uh, sorry, and the land is its lamp. So remember, brothers and sisters, that light is is frequently a metaphor referring to God himself, you know, uh, that metaphor of light. Because why? In Genesis 1, it says, God said, let there be light. So that, that metaphor of light was often used of, of um, God himself. We know Jesus said in, in John 8, he said, I am the light of the world. Uh, we also yeah. know in uh, 1 John 1 5 it says God is light in him uh, there is no uh, darkness uh, we know also from the Psalms where it says thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light Thank unto you. my path uh, but the image specifically taken here of there not being a you know a sun or a moon is this idea remember the sun or the moon were celestial bodies in the book of Genesis that God uh, put in place to govern the days and the seasons but I guess when we're in eternal life uh, time has a very different concept. Uh, so uh, there is no longer any need for the sun or the moon because I guess God is so glorious that his majesty lights new creation, which is quite powerful when we think about it. But also the image here uh, or the reference here is, is to Isaiah 60, which in verse 19 to 20 says, no longer will the sun be your light by day, nor the brightness of the moon shine on your night. For the Lord will be your everlasting light and your God will be your splendor. Your sun will no longer set, and your moon will not wane, for the Lord will be your everlasting light, and the days of your sorrow will cease. So it's it's a recognition that we need the sun and the moon. You take the sun and the moon out of creation, and the universe and our earth, well, not the universe, but our earth is gone. That's it. We can't, life can't flourish. So what's being said here, and people recognize that you needed the sun and the moon for life to flourish on earth. What's being recognized here is that God himself, all in all, is the source of all of new creation. He's the source of life itself. And in new creation, we will see that. That's hidden from our eyes now. People, you know, in this in this scientific world think uh, that the universe is our source, the atoms are uh, uh, the source of life, et cetera, et cetera. But it's a recognition that uh, when we come to Christ, we realize that God him himself is uh, the source of all existence. In Psalm 48, sorry, Psalm 84, it says, for the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. He withholds, he withholds no good thing from those who walk with integrity. So we see that creation ordinance of what happened in Genesis 1, where God said, uh, you know, he placed the lights, those celestial lights. And it's important because people in the ancient world, pagans thought that the sun and the moon were deities. They deified the creation. They exchanged the invisible creator for created objects like the sun and the moon and the planets and the stars, believing them to be God. God's Roman, uh, once Romans chapter one talks about this. So the very creation audience, uh, ordinance of chapter, of chapter one comes full circle that the sun and the moon have done their job, so to speak. They no longer need to light this planet for God himself will be the one to uh, guide and lead his people for all eternity. Uh, any, any observations you would like to make there, or is that uh, pretty straightforward? Pretty straightforward. Yeah. Straightforward, yeah. Excellent. Well, we're coming to the close to the end of the chapter, but 24, the nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. So again, brothers and sisters, this is something which is uh, being fulfilled through the Great Commission. It's an important point that I've come back to on multiple times for us not just to see these chapters as, oh, that is something which is going to happen in the future. It will culminate mm -hmm. in the future. It will be rubber stamped and finalized. But it is something which is happening progressively, like the mustard seed, which grows and grows and grows today. Because obviously in new creation, there's no national borders anymore. There's no nations per se. There are different uh, ethnic groups, but there's no nations because we're one people. There's no borders because we're one people group. So this is something which is being uh, fulfilled through the Great Commission. And there's a number of places uh, in the Old Testament, which alludes to this, there's a number of references there. Uh, Isaiah 60 verse 3 says, Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. 
Uh, could somebody please find for us that it, uh, Isaiah 66 verse 18 reference? Uh, another person, just the Jeremiah 317 and somebody else, Zechariah 1416, just so we can see that this theme reoccurs uh, and this notion reoccurs. Okay, so Isaiah 66 verse 18 says, And I, because of what they have planned and done, am about to come and gather the people of all nations and languages and they will come and see my glory. Jeremiah 3.17 says, At that time they will call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all nations will gather in Jerusalem to honour the name of the Lord. No longer will they follow the stubbornness of their evil hearts. Zechariah 14.16, that the survivors from all the nations that I've Attack Jerusalem or get up year after year to worship the King, the Lord Almighty, and to, to celebrate the Festival of Tabernacles. Amen. Absolutely. So we can see that all the nations are coming. The nations are part of God's plan. And when we think about the nations being part of God's plan, we think about the calling we have to take the gospel message to all nations through the Great Commission. And as we know, Jesus himself said, my house will be a house of prayer for all nations. Uh, in that vision in Revelation 7, we saw the mixed multitude from every nation, tribe, uh, and tongue uh, rejoicing and worshipping the Lamb before the throne. So this idea now, the second part of the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. I'll come back to this uh, in a slightly different way in verse 26 because it refers to this again as well. But I just want to mention that uh, kings obviously would, or kings or rulers could be another way to interpret this world, this word. Uh, kings would often pay tribute or esteem more powerful kings, right? Uh, that's why Jesus is described as the, the king of kings, because if you were a king of an empire and you expanded your empire and you took out other nations or other tribes and you made other kings submit to you, you would often make them pay tribute or esteem you and stream esteem you as a greater king. So this is a recognition that all on earth will recognize that God and Christ are the ultimate rulers. There'll be nobody else who is a ruler except for God and Christ. And usually when they pay tribute or they esteemed a greater, more powerful king, they did so reluctantly because it was like uh, one king submitting to another, uh, they would always do so reluctantly. Royalty doesn't like to submit, in other words. Um, so what is being seen here is that the nations and the kings and the princes, of the, they're willingly submitting to God, to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's a beautiful picture of new creation, that all nations and the rulers of those nations uh, submit willingly to the true king. And it would be a beautiful thing in our world if our kings and our rulers would submit to the one true God in heaven and submit and walk by his light. It's a big problem in our world, isn't it, brothers and sisters, that there are mm -hmm. individuals within nations who want to submit and walk by God's light, uh, but there are nations themselves and the rulers of their nations who don't want to submit and walk by uh, mm -hmm. God's light. Um, and in verse... Yeah. 25, we read, on, on no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. There will The glory and honour of the nations will be brought into it. So we have that theme repeated again here. But uh, just once again, we remind ourselves that gates were important. Uh, gates were important to a city. Uh, and the gates would often be closed at night for security if you have a different gates to a wall or you have uh, different gates to the temple they would be closed at night why it's for security why would you close the temple gates well same reason why we close the church gates it's for security temples in the ancient world were also banks they were also treasuries you close because you don't want people coming and robbing the the temple treasuries uh gates to the city you would close those gates why so soldiers or enemies in the night wouldn't come in and try to take yes. out you know it was that famous story in the ancient world the trojan horse principle you mm. didn't want somebody to open the gate so that the enemy could come in here but now we see that the gates are permanently open they're permanently open so people can come in you know interestingly uh why are the gates permanently open well there's two reasons number one is because there's eternal security there's everlasting security uh, God's kingdom will no longer be at risk because it's perfect, it's fulfilled. Uh, God's people will never be under threat. But this is a fulfillment of the Sabbath opening presented in uh, Ezekiel 
sorry, in Ezekiel 46, verse 1. So remember, Ezekiel, this section, these 40s, the chapters in the 40s in Ezekiel are talking about that new idealized temple, that restored creation. Uh, the in the language, the people were instructed to keep the gates closed six days of the week, but to open the gates on one day in particular. What day was that? The seventh Sabbath. day, the Sabbath day. So why are the gates opened all the time and never shut? Well, the reason is, is because in eternal life, we will be in the everlasting Sabbath rest. Every day will be the Sabbath day in new creation. Every day will be the day of rest. Every day will be the day to connect with God and to rejoice. And the point here, brothers and sisters, is this is a fulfillment of the creation narrative. Many people miss this about the creation narrative because they spend a lot of time focusing on what those days in creation mean. But what do we notice in um, the seventh day when God creates the seventh day? Uh, if you were to turn with me to the very, very first chapter, and I remind you, remember, brothers and sisters, I told you before that these final few chapters of the book of Revelation are bringing the whole scripture full circle. In Genesis chapter 1, we notice here it says that uh, thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. And notice it goes on to say, by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from the work he had created, the, the work of creating that he had done. Now, the resting of God is not talking about physically, oh, I'm tired, I need to sleep. God, of course, does not get tired. Mm -hmm. But the rest that's spoken about there is, is a perfect completion. You mm -hmm. rest because things are completed and they're perfect. Now, one thing that distinguishes the Sabbath day or the seventh day from the other six days is there's no morning and evening. So in other words, time is not a parameter on the seventh day. You could mm. say that it's everlasting. And what disrupts mm. this seventh day of rest for God? Sin. Mm. So what is being brought full circle is we're going back to the Sabbath rest where now there is that perfect completion and that perfect rest. So just to demonstrate that I wasn't making up that Ezekiel reference, it says this is, <laughs> uh, in 46, it says this is what the Sovereign <laughs> Lord says. The gate of the inner court facing east is to be shut on the six working days, but on the Sabbath day and on the day of the new moon, it is to be opened. So this idea of there being an everlasting, an everlasting Sabbath rest is told to us in Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9, it says there remains then a Sabbath rest for God's, for the people of God. So this is a wonderful thing, brothers and sisters, that this is what we have to look forward to. The gates are always open because we're always entering into the presence of God. Every single day, we uh, enter into the presence of, of God in new creation. So it's a, it's a beautiful picture. Um, and remember in uh, Psalm, 100 and, uh, Psalm 100, verse 4 to 5, it says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving uh, and into his courts with praise. What's that talking about? That's talking about the temple precinct. And enter into the gates through the gates of the temple with thanksgiving and praise. Enter into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. Now, so what is it saying? We're entering into the gates of the Lord every single day of the week. For everlasting life, we will be uh, worshipping God in eternity. Uh, and once again, I want to come back to what we saw in the previous uh, in, in verse 24, where it says in the previous slide, where it says the glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. So again, we see the nations are coming into the temple of God. Remember in the Old uh, Testament, in the Old Covenant, in the first century, uh, Gentiles were not allowed to enter into the uh, temple of God. The high mm -hmm. priest was the only one authorized once a year to enter into the Holy of Holies, whereas now we have people from every nation entering into the court of God, into entering into the very throne room of God, which is a beautiful picture. Uh, but notice it says that the glory and the honor of the nations is brought into the city or into the uh, temple. Uh, well, recall in Revelation 18, remember we had the fall of Jerusalem and in Revelation 18 verses 11 to 20, the nations are weeping. The merchants of the nations were weeping because now that Jerusalem is being destroyed, now that it has been cut down, the economic prosperity that Jerusalem brought is destroyed and they're weeping. 
Now we have uh, the contrast, the antithesis of this. They're no longer weeping, but the nations are celebrating their honor and their glory uh, is now celebrating. Whereas they were weeping at the fall of the harlot city, now they're celebrating at the restored creation. Uh, so I think that point is also noteworthy there. Uh, any uh, discussion points, that, anything that you would like to bring up here? Excellent. Well, let's just finish off with verse 27. Nothing uh, too difficult for us to understand. Verse 27, nothing impure will enter in it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Just uh, we've just touched on this point so many times before. It's 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 uh should be well memorized by you now. Uh, the Lamb's Book of Life, part of the numerical tapestry of the Book of Revelation. It's mentioned seven times. You'd know this by now. Uh, this this is the sixth of those seven times. It'll be mentioned one more in the next chapter. Uh, it's a metaphor for salvation. Uh, Jesus says, you know, uh, ancient people had. It's it's got that um that idea of that sort of magisterial sort of idea or like a a registrar or a census a register of all of the citizens and the idea is that just like there was a census taken of god's people in heaven there's a census of those who are in christ and those who are inheritance of uh eternal life and eternal salvation that one day when we're in heaven and our judgment comes the books will be opened and our names will be on the uh the the documents and the the the, the uh, magisterial notes of heaven, so to speak. But remember, what does Jesus say in Luke chapter 10? He says, nevertheless, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Our names are written in heaven, brothers and sisters. And we, um, For the benefit of those listening to this, I'm not going to name anyone's names because that would be a privacy breach, but our names are written in heaven. You know, there's a, there's mm -hmm. a, uh, a blank so-and-so in heaven. There's a blank this person, a blank person. Our names are written in heaven, but notice here that nothing impure will enter in it. Why? Because of what we've read in the previous chapters, that where are the impure things? Where are the sinful, shameful, deceitful? They are in the lake of fire. Those who have rejected Christ are in the lake of fire. Uh, so nighttime, brothers and sisters, was sometimes associated with evil and sorcery or wickedness, right? Yeah. Often when we read the poetry of the Old Testament, the evil is done at night. Um, the prostitute who comes out at night. But notice that nothing evil or impure or sinful can enter into it. No evil spirit which Jesus drove out can enter in. No person who is spiritually unclean is the important thing. No spiritually unclean person could enter into it. Again, if we think about how the first readers or the heirs of the Old Testament would have been reading this, they would have known that in the Old Testament under the Old Covenant, there were restrictions as to who could enter into the temple. Uh, those who were spiritually unclean, those who had rejected God, those who were had some sort of uncleanness about them. You know, the prostitutes, the unclean people, the lepers would often live outside the city gates. Now, in Christ, he has made clean those who were spiritually unclean. Now they can be brought into the presence of God. Those groups that Jesus ate with, the sinners, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the unclean, who he made clean and had fellowship with, were once afar now they've been brought in. And what we have here is this recognition that those who are, are not washed clean by the blood of Christ are in now a state of eternal uncleanness and in a state of eternal uncleanness, sorry, in a state of in eternal uncleanness, they are forbidden to enter into the temple of God. Only by being washed in the blood of Christ does a person become clean. Does a person move from unclean to clean? There's no other way. There's no good deed you can do. There is nothing else that you can do to wash yourself spiritually clean. So those who are not washed in the blood of Christ are spiritually unclean for all eternity. And they are in the lake of fire. They have no share in the new creation. They're not a diamond in the new creation. They're molten rock in the lake of fire. And as in Ezekiel 44 is on show here, this is what the Lord God says. No foreigner uncircumcised in heart and flesh may enter my sanctuary, not even a foreigner who lives among the Israelites. Notice what's being said there. What is the distinction here? In Christ, there is no Jew or Gentile. So in Christ, there's no foreigners. But there are spiritual foreigners to God. There are spiritual uh, uncircumcised followers. What made you a uh, uh, part of the people of God? It was circumcision for men. Uh, but what does God say? He's going to circumcise the heart. 
He's going to replace the heart of stone with the heart of flesh. He's going to circumcise, the Bible says, the heart. So what is being said here is that there are foreigners, not by ethnicity, but by spirituality to the kingdom of God. Those who are not in Christ, those of us who are in Christ, our citizenship is in heaven. There's a record of our citizenship in heaven. But those who are not in Christ are spiritually unclean for all eternity. They are foreigners to God. And they're foreigners to the promise. They're foreigners to the kingdom of God. So they don't enjoy citizenship in the kingdom of God. And in chapter 19, we read, sorry, in, in 19 and 20, we read the sad news that they are cast into the lake of fire, while the rest of us who are no longer foreigners. Remember, the Bible in Ephesians says, once you were strangers, once you were foreigners, now you have been brought near. Those of us who are spiritually clean in Christ, are now those who will no longer remain outside, but we will remain inside for all eternity.